So what the hell happened to the Republican Party? Right? They, they seemed far more progressive in 1854 than in 1954, and probably also in 2054, right? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's be honest. If they continue on the same trajectory that they are on right now, the Republicans might just turn into the national KKK super Hitler party. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 no. That's the line we're at. Welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm your host, Krish Mohan. Uh, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. Uh, just a quick note before we di dive into this episode. This was recorded in front of a live virtual audience via Zoom. And if you want to be part of the virtual live stand-up comedy shows, you totally can. Uh, tickets are available for these shows right now. They are in the description below. They're happening on Friday nights. They're happening Friday nights. Uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. They're $5 tickets, and each week uh, is new material, so you can get multiple different uh, tickets for multiple different shows. And not only that, but we also help a grassroots organization or a grassroots venue, activist or journalist, uh, because uh, we all got to take care of each other. So uh, each week is a different uh, grassroots organization for this show the show that you're about to watch we donated half of our ticket sales to a movement for a people's party uh, who are actively working to organize to essentially make a a movement for a people's party a period a party that is more representative of the people than corporations and uh, they're they're awesome uh, I've had Nick Brana, one of the founders on the show, on my uh, interview podcast, Taboo Table Talk, several different times. He's fantastic. Uh, so uh, if you want to donate to them, if you want to learn more about them, uh, peoplesparty.org. You can find the link in the description below. If you want to attend them, like I said, there's tickets uh, to these live virtual stand-up comedy shows. But if you want a free ticket, you can become a sustaining member. You can become a sustaining member right at krishmohan.com. It's K-R-I-S-H. M-O-H-A-N dot com. You can become a sustaining member directly on my website through Patreon or via Bandcamp. Through this, you get free tickets to these live virtual stand-up comedy shows. You, you get uh, uh, un unreleased exclusive stand-up comedy and storytelling material. You get uh, bonus merch. Uh, and you get early access to larger full episodes of Fork Full of Noodles like this one that you're watching right now. Uh, so go to krishmohan.com, check out those feature dates, and I hope to see you at a show. And now, without any further ado, let's dive into this week's episode. But a key aspect of making ranked choice voting work is having more than two parties. Actually, you know what? In America, it would be great if we had two parties. That'd be fun. Uh, but, yeah, but as we discussed earlier, uh, they're both the parties of money. And both parties were for Nixon's racist drug war. Also his racist regular war. They were for that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But in America, the so-called third parties, like the Green Party, the Libertarian, and even the Socialist Party, are called spoilers, right? They're called spoilers. But I've never found this to make any sense, right? Calling third parties spoilers has always been this weird, odd thing to me. Because not once, not once have they given away the ending to a Marvel movie. Like, not. <laughs> you know? I waited fucking three days to watch Avengers Endgame, and not one libertarian or Green Party or socialist gave away the ending. And I, there were a couple neoliberals that were like, hey, did you see that part where Cap picks up Thor's hammer? It's like, God, God damn it. God damn it, Joe Biden. Stay off Twitter. Of, you son of a bitch, I know. But not <laughs> once not one socialist did it. Because they respect art. So 
But, you know, these third parties, they do represent the end of a corporate monopoly of the American election dumpster fire. So I guess in that way, they are kind of like a spoiler, you know? They're, they're like the spoiler to a dying empire, you know? And spoiler alert, it's, uh, it's going to die. It is going to die. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I'll, I'll log off. <laughs> right. we, we did it, you guys. <laughs> but here's the thing, right? Without a third party, the Republican Party wouldn't actually exist because they were, in fact, a third party. Right? The Whigs and the Democrats were not listening to party members uh, who didn't want to see slavery in their society anymore. So what did they do? They decided to break off and move in a completely different direction. So in 1854, uh, the Whigs and a bunch of uh, various members of uh, uh, you know, other fringe parties decided to start the process of creating their own new party. The straw that broke the camel's back, as you can see here, is, was the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which wanted to make sure that Kansas and Nebraska were slave states. Uh, the members of the Whigs were opposed to more slave states, but when the leadership disagreed, it gave birth to the Republican Party. Their first state convention was in Jackson, Michigan in 1854, and then in 1856, their first national convention was in my hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yeah, they didn't even try to organize in the Southern states. Can you imagine the Republicans didn't even organize in the Southern states because they didn't think that they could win down there. So to recap, the reason why the Republican party was created was to fight against slavery and formed in Northern working class cities. They stood against slavery. They were for expanding the banks, higher tariffs on the rich, and free land to farmers. Yeah, that's right, guys. They were farming socialists. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, wait a minute. Oh, can you guys hear that noise? Yeah, that noise is uh, the sound of every Republican's heart bursting at the knowledge of that. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're all exploding at the same time. <laughs> now, this was the party of Lincoln, right? This is why Lincoln even won in the first place. And when he did, he gave this bombastic speech, right? In his speech, he says, when you speak of us Republicans, you do so only to denounce us as reptiles or at the best as no better than outlaws. You will grant a hearing to pirates or murderers, but nothing like it to black Republicans. Wow but you will not abide by the election of a Republican president. In that supposed event, you will say you will destroy the union. And then you say the great crime of having uh, destroyed it will be upon us. That is cool. A highwayman holds a pistol to my ear and mutters through his teeth, stand and deliver or I shall kill you. Then you will be a murderer. <laughs> yeah. That's a bombastic ass speech right there. <laughs> Lincoln is basically calling out the spoiler argument in 1860, right? It was a bullshit argument 160 years ago, and it's a bullshit argument now, right? So, so what the hell happened to the Republican Party, right? They, they seemed far more progressive in 1854 than in 1954, and probably also in 2054, right? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's be honest. If they continue on the same trajectory that they are on right now, the Republicans might just turn into the national KKK super Hitler party. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 no. <laughs> That's the line we're in. So here's what happened, right? After uh, Lincoln's assassination, the party had grown and there were two factions. There were the radicals and the moderates. Sounding familiar? Right. By the time President Grant was in office in 1868, the radical Republicans, which is a super weird thing to say out loud, uh, <laughs> 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 the, 
the radical Republicans were in control, right? Uh, these guys were forming unions, mobilizing voters in the South, and they were fighting off the KKK. Yeah. Guys, you heard me correctly. The Republicans were fighting the KKK, right? So with that knowledge, the next time one of these whitewashed modern Republicans claims to be the party of Lincoln, ask them when was the last time they broke up a Klan rally or kicked David Duke directly in the dick. <laughs> <laughs> If the answer is never, then they're not the party of Lincoln, right? Really, Republicans, modern Republicans anyway, should, should definitely not compare themselves to the Republicans of the yesteryears. Or the nickname I like for them is the Afro Klan Hunters. I think that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's a fun nickname for the Republicans of 1868. <laughs> so by 18... 72, there were at least, at least seven black Republican congressmen from Southern states, right? As you can see, Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, Florida, fucking Florida. Holy shit, Florida got something right. <laughs> That's crazy. And this, this happened despite the fact that the South was particularly difficult for the Republicans to gain a massive foothold and become a biracial party. They were having a really, really hard time. But this fact right here is what brings us to the subject of Confederate statues. Look, this is where I draw the line, right? 1871, if you get up to 1871, if you build a statue before 1871, fine. Fucking keep it up, right? I'll leave it alone. Leave your loser ass heritage alone. That's fine, right? If it's after 1872, it's not heritage. It's you being a massive dick and the sorest of all fucking losers. That's what you are. If you really want this to be a part of your heritage and you build a statue after 1872, then your Republican heritage should include every single one of these radical black Republicans. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So here's where the trouble begins. In the 1880s, the Republicans were starting to lose steam because of German and Irish Catholic immigrants who were supporting the Democrats a lot more, and also the fact that the Republicans became sober. They were a dry party. They didn't like booze, right? Now, I think this is probably where the anti-immigrant rhetoric comes from, but here's the thing. I don't remember shit on immigrants being part of the 12-step program. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. oh my god <laughs> so the republicans started calling the democrats the party of rum romanism and rebellion right rum because the democrats were linked to tavern keepers romanism because of the irish roman catholics and rebellion to remind folks that they were trying to break up the union during the civil war <laughs> that's what they were trying to do so by the time of the McKinley administration, which I believe was 1896, 1898, somewhere within there, the Republican Party starts becoming the party we see today, right? President McKinley vowed to decrease tariffs and develop a partnership with big business like rail companies. Now, with that in mind, he promoted the idea of plural, pluralism. It's a very hard word to say, uh, which basically means that he was aiming to get prosperity for all by the first version of trickle-down economics, which is an idea that would go on to fail for over a hundred goddamn years. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. It fails so much, you guys. <laughs> so William McKinley went for the money and started transforming the Republican Party into the party of privatization. So really, modern, McKin modern Republicans are the party of McKinley who was assassinated and they should all take note of that. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing, the Republican Party itself is responsible for the birth of America's, one, one of America's you know, most famous third parties besides itself, of course. 
right? In 1901, Teddy Roosevelt became president. And by the end of his term, he saw what the party was becoming and, uh, and he started denouncing it. So Teddy goes on to say, uh, again and again in my public career, I have had to make head against mob spirit, against the tendency of poor, ignorant, and turbulent people who feel a rancorous jealousy and hatred for those who are better off. But during the last few years, it has been the wealthy corruptionists of enormous fortune and of enormous influence through their agents of the press, pulpit, college, and public life with whom I've waged a bitter war. Yeah. Hmm. Teddy Roosevelt uh, turned out to be a kind of cool dude uh, with a somewhat large forehead. So... <laughs> <laughs> So that led Teddy Roosevelt uh, to, to create the Blue Moose Party, right? As we mentioned earlier, William Howard Taft uh, was chosen to become the Republican nominee despite Teddy Roosevelt winning nine out of 13 states in the 1912 election. He was so disillusioned by the system that he created the progressive Bull Moose Party of 1912. He ran on a square deal, which had three goals, conservation of natural resources, control of corporations and consumer protection. I mean, he's already outlefted most modern Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just with those yeah. three statements alone. Now, he also wanted to dissolve the unholy alliance between corporate business and corporate politics. Guys, Teddy realized that only the devil could come up with an alliance between business and politics, right? Only the devil would enact an idea as fiendish as math manipulation. Only the devil could make evil so fucking boring, right? That rascal. Yeah, right? I mean, <laughs> guys, look at what God was doing. You know, God was sending his kid down to turn water into wine. That's a party move right there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that dude knew how to throw down. He was walking on water. What? That's some David Blaine shit. <laughs> you know? He was raising people from the dead. I was like, nobody's ever done that before, right? And... <laughs> Here's another thing that he did. He punched bankers directly in the dick. That's very exciting. Stuff. <laughs> That's super exciting. He hate Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. A lot of people don't talk about that, but he definitely, he definitely got some uppercuts to the nads. You know, that's not in the book. That's left for interpretation, and that's how I interpret it. <laughs> <laughs> In my head, he ducks, and then it's a lot of uppercuts to the nads. That's what it is. <laughs> so It's probably in the Bible. It's probably in there, right? Yeah. <laughs> Open to interpretation. But this is where the unholiness comes from, right? Those bankers are now making legislation to fuck over the working class and blatantly overusing words like here too and thou. Like, it's too much. It's too much. Speak English, bankers. That's what I got to say. So in 1912, the Bull Moose Party took 20% of the votes. They tied with the Republicans. Unfortunately, uh, the party didn't last, right? The party disbanded, mostly because its members wanted to win instead of drive real change. But 1912 was a pretty big year for new parties because the Socialist Party of America was also taking hold at the same time. In 1912, Eugene Victor Debs was running for president under the Socialist Party of America. There, there are some folks who consider Bernie Sanders to be the Eugene Debs of today, but that isn't really true, right? In 1884, back in 1884, Debs was elected to the Indiana House of Representatives. He was a union man, right? And henceforth, he introduced a lot of bills to help the families of injured rail workers. He gave riveting speeches that led to these bills passing in the House, but then left to die in the Democrat-controlled Senate. Debs did not 
did not run for the House again because he saw the Democratic Party for what it was, a corrupt, soulless party that is willing to let its people die for money. That's what he knew about them in 1884. Debs left the party. Bernie did not. Bernie tried to reform the party from within, but Debs realized that the party is unwilling to reform. He saw that over a hundred years before Bernie Sanders. But Bernie wants to be liked by the Democratic Party, and the reality is that they're, they're never, they're never going to like him. Right? They've spent the better part of this decade alone demonizing him and his flagship ideas. Right? Bernie has become that nerd that desperately tries to win the friendship of the jocks only to get tackled over and over and over. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's a reality we need to face, that Bernie Sanders is no Eugene Debs. And uh, this is uh, Chris Hedges, who I don't recommend if you're, if you're looking for hope. Uh, this is Chris Hedges talking about Bernie Sanders and his need to be liked by the, uh, uh, the party. And Shama pushed Bernie before the event. I was there as to why he wouldn't run as an independent, arguing correctly that we were never going to build an effective political movement in an election cycle, and we were not going to build it within the confines of the Democratic Party. Sanders' answer was that he didn't want to become Ralph Nader. Uh, what did that mean? What does it mean? Nader ran for president several times. He actually did quite well in 2000, uh, getting almost 5% of the vote. The Democratic Party had to destroy him. They were terrified. I was Nader's speechwriter. And they did. They turned him into a pariah. Uh, and that's what Sanders meant. He knew the Democratic Party machine would destroy him. Uh, they would... Uh, mount uh, an intensive campaign to deny him his Senate seat. That's, you know, what they did to McGovern. People forget George McGovern, our last, the last Democratic nominee to take on the military industrial establishment. He didn't want to be Ralph Nader. So back to Debs, right? Uh, Eugene Debs left politics, and then he went on to start the American railway union and then he led the Pullman strikes of 1894. This was one of the many times that the American military was called to fire upon its own citizens to break up strikes, right? In order to prevent a general strike, which would have been a peaceful protest, the American military, under the order of the Insurrection Act, used its force, killed 30 strikers, injuring 57 others and causing $80 million worth of damage in 1894, $80 million in 1894. Now, you know how like when you were kids, you know, your parents would like, if you're like roughing around in the back of the car, like your parents would be like, ah, oh, we're going to, we're going to turn this car around, you bastards, you know, like, you know, when they were threatened. <laughs> yeah. If you like didn't show up, they're like, oh, we're going to turn this car around. <laughs> Calling the military to shut down general strikes is basically the government's version of that. But instead of going home, it's like if your parents ran your car into a Walmart and then blamed the <laughs> kids for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> And that's basically what they did in, in, in 1894, right? The rich railroad tycoons used a bunch of their media propaganda to turn the public against unions, blaming them for the damage, blaming them for the, de de the debt, and then they put Debs on trial, right? After, and then he was put into prison for six months under conspiracy charges. Yeah. After, he was, uh, after he was released uh, in, in uh, 19, 1900, uh, he created the Socialist Party of America and ran for president five times, he ran five times. His goal was to create a system that would empower workers and reduce militarism in America. So he challenged capitalism at every turn, at every turn. And he pointed out how the Democratic Party is not really for the progressive. 
right? He goes on to say the radical and the progressive elements of the former democracy have been ev evicted and must seek quarters. They were an unmitigated nuisance in the conservative councils of the old party. They were for the common people and the trusts have no use for such a party. Where but to the socialist party can these progressive people turn? Every true Democrat should thank Wall Street for driving them out of a party that is democratic in name only and into one that is democratic in fact. Bam. How about nice. that for some fucking bombastic speeches, huh? <laughs> Here's why Eugene Debs might be better than me is because he didn't say fuck once in that at all. <laughs> Not even once. <laughs> so in 1911, leading up to his run against Woodrow Wilson, uh, by the way, he had a he had a train that he he rode around called the Red Special, is what he called it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Nin 1908 to 1911, he ran his campaigns on the Red Special. Um, <laughs> it's pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, so leading up to his run, this is he he said this right. He said we should seek to only register the actual vote of socialism, no more, no less. In our propaganda, we should state our principles clearly, speak the truth fearlessly, seeking neither to flatter nor to offend, but only to convince those who should be with us and win them to our cause through an intelligent understanding of its mission. Socialism must be organized, drilled, equipped, and the place to begin is in the industries where the workers are employed. So like I said, he wanted, he wanted to empower the workers. He was literally the first true candidate that was running as an organizer in chief. In 1912, he got 1 million votes. That was 6%. He got 6% of the votes. He got no national attention, attention and was virtually a nobody in the political arena. And he still got 6% percent of the votes. In 1918, at age 63, after giving an anti-war speech, he was in imprisoned under the Espionage Act, which if you don't know what the Espionage Act is, that's the reason Julian Assange is still in prison, right? And in 1918, the big tough American war machine was afraid of an elderly socialist in a top hat. <laughs> So, okay, so I know some of you guys are like, Chris, you're being kind of hard. What did he say in his speech? You know, what was the 1918 speech all about? So in that speech, Deb points out the only, only the rich make war and decide the terms of the peace. The middle class who would fight these wars don't get to be involved in that process, which we don't. When was the last time an average iron worker was invited to any of the treaties of Paris? Right. Right. Yes. And really, when you think about it, when was the last time that you heard the word treaty in our lexicon? <laughs> <laughs> the answer to that question is 1898, you guys. That's the last time. Uh, we've Since then, we've pretty much replaced the word treaty with submit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. Oh, dear. Now, after Eugene Debs' speech pointed out how the middle class has been cannon fodder for the arms industry in battle for imperialistic control of power and resources, Debs was sentenced to three 10-year prison sentences and had his right to vote revoked. This is basically the origin of the prison industrial complex, right? Mm -hmm. We don't treat prisoners like they're people. We treat them like they're turncoats in a revolution against nothing. Now, he ran for president again from prison in 1920. <laughs> and he got another 6% of the votes. Imagine how well he would have done if he was not a political prisoner. You know, riding around on the red special out there. <laughs> 
During his time in the Atlanta penitentiary, he was a major, major advocate for prison reform because he saw firsthand what was happening. He was liked so much by the prisoners that when he got out, the prisoners made him a hand-carved cane. That's how much they liked him. So, in, in 1912, 6% of the people rejected the Democratic Party. And again, in 1920, 6% of the people rejected the Democratic Party. In 1912, 20% of the people rejected the Republican Party. So, over a quarter of the country rejected the duopoly over a hundred years ago. So why is it that Americans can't do that a century later? America is taught to be a, a country of winners, right? Going against the American way of exceptionalism and the corporate duopoly is, you're, you're called a loser. That's what you're called in, in the system. And the reason why we choose to vote to win rather than vote our beliefs is because we have an election system that says that you don't matter unless you're the winner. But voting against your beliefs means that you've already lost. Our passive relationship with voting makes us forget that life is political. Healthcare, race relations, immigrations, all of that affects how you feed your family, your health, and your job. So if you don't engage in politics, then you don't engage in life. And if we want to win, we have to burn our apathy in the trash and support the fight for a brand new system. And that is your Forkful of Noodles for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a share. Please give it a thumbs up and share it around and make sure that you're subscribed to this channel. Uh, this channel often gets suppressed because we don't particularly talk about things that uh, that the algorithm deems is cool. <laughs> so uh, we depend on, uh, uh, or I depend on you guys uh, sharing it out to as many people as you possibly can. Um, there's going to be a bunch of cool stuff coming up on this channel. Uh, videos like this, more scripted history-based socio-political commentary. Uh, there's rantier videos about uh, current events, news. There, there's more uh, bite-sized videos about uh, specific topics, and there's going to be interviews coming up on this channel as well that I'm excited to share with you guys. So uh, there's going to be a bunch of cool stuff coming up on this channel. Uh, virtually every single day of the week, you can probably find some videos coming up on this channel. So make sure you're subscribed to that. Uh, and like I mentioned at the very top of the show, this was recorded in front of a, a, a live virtual audience. So if you would like to be part of a live virtual audience, you can totally do so by purchasing tickets and, uh, and coming out to, to hang out with us and, and take part in the Citizen Revolution live virtual stand-up comedy shows. Uh, they happen on Fridays um, and uh, at 9 p.m. They're only five bucks and we donate half the proceeds to, uh, to a grassroots organization venue, journalists, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and this video that you're watching right now, we donated half the ticket sales to a movement for a people's party. Uh, so if you would like to learn even more about them, if you would like to donate to them, you can do so at peoplesparty.org. The link is in the description below. Uh, and uh, I hope to see you guys at one of these events. I hope you guys will go grab your tickets. Go to krishmohan.com for those tickets. It's K-R-I-S-H. M-O-H-A-N, become a sustaining make member, make a one-time donation, buy an album, go nuts with watching a bunch of these videos, go crazy about it. Uh, but Krishmohan.com is your one-stop shop for all things Krishmohan. Uh, I hope to see you guys again soon. Thanks for tuning in. And we'll